if you can't talk to your partner about this, you're probably not in the right relationship. Uh, and because there are so many things to talk about later in life, you know, you're in, even if you don't have children, health decisions, you know, who does what if someone, yeah. you know, ends up having a heart attack. Like there are so many decisions that rely on open communication that I think, you know, use this opportunity to figure it out. I'm Kelty McGuire and you're listening to the Kids Are Child Free podcast. Hello and welcome to the Kids Are Child Free podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about the metaphorical elephant in the room, the thing that none of us want to acknowledge is there or discuss, let alone think about. But it's really something that we cannot avoid if we are on the fence about whether or not to have kids. And that is the topic of fertility. Now, when I was on the fence about whether or not to have kids, I kept pushing off the decision as long as possible, as long as I thought that my fertility might afford me, because I just found it so hard to make a decision, and yet I knew that I eventually had to decide. I have the perfect guest for today's conversation that I am bringing on to talk about all things fertility, everything we need to know if we're on the fence about whether or not to have kids and thinking about maybe becoming pregnant in the future and having a child or children. And that is Leslie Schrock, the author of the book Fertility Rules. Leslie is not only an author, but she's also an angel investor working at the Convergence of Health and Technology. Her breakout hit, Bumpin', The Modern Guide to Pregnancy, mixes the latest clinical research with practical advice for working families. Her second book, the aforementioned Fertility Rules, takes the same approach for male and female fertility. Leslie is also an advisor to Maven, A Life, Origin, Oath, and Reverence. She's on Gamito's Bioethics Board and the Board of Advisors at the Moody School of Communication at her alma mater, the University of Texas at Austin. Leslie was named one of Fast Company's most creative people in business, and her work has been featured on CNBC, NPR, Time, GQ, Fortune, Entrepreneur, Wired, The Economist, and The New York Times. And of course, last but not least, the Kids Are Child Free podcast. Hello, Leslie. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. And I was saying to Leslie before we started recording that this is a conversation I wish I could have had and information that I wish I had access to when I was making my own kids or child free decision. Um, and so we're going to get right into it. Now, Leslie, you have a very impressive background. I have to say, I'm, you don't look a day over. I mean, I'm not going to venture a guess here, but you seem to have lived many different lives in terms of all the various experiences you've had, the businesses you're involved with, um, as well as, of course, the two books that you've written. So I'd love if you could just share a little bit about who you are and, and specifically what sort of know-how you can bring us on the topic of fertility. Well, I'm 41 in case you were asking, but okay. uh, <laughs> I am too. <laughs> it's, it's a great age. I, I love is. this age. I love the forties. It has been such a great decade so far, um, yeah. even with two small kids, four and two. So thank you for saying that. I have had a very eclectic professional life. Um, I started at kind of, you know, working in advertising as a designer and writer and creative person and really moved into the business world as a function of my own healthcare journey. So I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis when I was 27. So that was the first time I had ever really interacted with the healthcare system in a serious way. And I kind of looked around and said, really? This is what we're doing now? This is the best we've got going on? And so I made my way. I was on the founding team of Rock Health. And ever since then, um, which is a startup accelerator based here in the US uh, that works with digital health companies. But after that, I started working very closely with a number of different startups as an investor and an advisor, um, including Maven, which is one a lot of people have heard of. It's a platform for you know family support and benefits. Uh, but, you know, I had been doing this work for a while. I knew a lot, or so I thought. And I decided it was time to start my own family and found myself, you know, at age 34, confronted with some very difficult uh, experiences. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, if it's this hard for me and I have a lot of, you know, wonderful resources through my work, what is this like for everyone else? And I kind of looked around and saw that we were not really talking about the things that I was going through, like miscarriage and fertility issues, and instead kind of presenting, you know, motherhood and parenting and pregnancy as this, 
experience that was just sunshine and puppies all the time. And any parent can tell you that it's not necessarily. It's oftentimes very challenging. Pregnancy is challenging. Fertility is challenging. And so um, I say that I'm an accidental author. I don't know that I ever intended to write two books. I'm a voracious reader, so I always knew I'd write something. But had you asked my 20-year-old self, will you research and interview you know, hundreds of people to write books about fertility and pregnancy, I don't know that I could have predicted that one. But that said, it's the most fulfilling work I've ever done. It is such a privilege that I take very seriously uh, to be on people's journeys. And um, I, you know, now that I'm writing books, I'm kind of addicted to it. So I'll probably write another one. Amazing. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see what, what's coming next. And I was telling Leslie that I actually have read Fertility Rules. And although I've made the decision not to have kids, I feel like this information is so important because as we'll hear today, I mean, fertility and, and our reproductive health is really an indicator of our overall health. And whether we like it or not, as I'm sure you know, if you're on the fence about whether or not to have kids, fertility in particular, but of course, pregnancy as well. These are topics we have to be thinking and talking about. And, it, you know, it's tough because I want to say as, as your clarity coach to help you figure out if you want kids or not, that we can just take it out of the equation so we can really just connect with what we want because it does tend to muddy the waters for a lot of us when we look at everything at once, when we're thinking, okay, I'm like looking down the barrel of a gun, so to speak. I've, you know, time is ticking. Each year is a new birthday, but we, we do need to, I think, at least like have some basic understanding of what's going on, the changes happening in our body, the likelihood that we can even become pregnant, you know, to the best of the knowledge that we have available to us. And so I was inspired to bring Leslie on today because, of course, I could bring on, let's say, a gynecologist or a reproductive expert, but I thought... I feel like it's more important to get like a broad cross section of what's happening. And Leslie, I love that you've talked to so many different experts because I think the risk we run and what I read in your book as well is like, there's not generally going to be consensus across every health professional. And certainly you mentioning you're in the States, I'm in Germany. Like, I think there's also different approaches and beliefs, um, across, across different countries. Um, I was telling Leslie before we started recording that I have endometriosis and just the amount of misinformation and different beliefs that different practitioners have about what is a very commonplace, um, you know, illness or condition, uh, it's, it's quite shocking. So um, enough from me. I just wanted to kind of set up this conversation a bit more. And, and Leslie, I, I'm sure everybody's wondering, first of all, um, do you have kids? And if so, I, I think you may have shared that already that you are a mom, but I want to hear about how you came to decide to have kids and was it a decision or was it something that you just knew you would do? It is such a great question. And I think I always knew I probably wanted to be a parent, but I think as so many people feel, so many women feel, it changes throughout your life. It changes based on who you're with. It changes based on what you're doing. It changes based on where you are. Um, so for me, you know, I think in my 20s, I probably couldn't have really imagined it. I was throwing myself into work. I knew that I wasn't quite, you know, in a place where I wanted to think about that. And I was in and out of a series of relationships with people that, frankly, I couldn't imagine having children with. So there was a period of time in my life where I thought, yeah, this just isn't going to happen for me. I just don't think I'm going to do this because of, you know, the, the choices I was making in terms of who I dated. And I had a great time and I regret nothing because I think... As so many people, you know, I talk to a lot of people about this too. And one of the things I tell them is that I lived. I mean, I lived in my 20s and 30s. I worked hard. I played hard. I traveled. I did a lot of the things that I knew I would later resent if I had a family and hadn't, you know, checked off some of those boxes. That said, you can still travel with kids. We do. Uh, it is very different. But, um, you know, I think in the end, I knew in, my, in the back of my head at some point, I would always, I would have kids. I kind of knew that the number for me was two max because I like, you know, man defense. I like having the <laughs> close one-to-one -one relationships. I have friends who have four and they're very happy. So, you know, for me, it was really a question of how do I want to spend the last half of my life now that I've spent the first half in such a, you know, like personally fulfilling, but also professionally fulfilling way. Yeah, that, that's such a great question to ask. And I have to say, 
it's the first time I've heard it asked that way. I mean, I think we think about, yeah, how do we want life to look? I mean, not, and, and frankly, not all of us do when we're considering children, but most of the people in my audience who are really grappling with this question. They're like, okay, what's, what's important to me? How do I want my life to look? But I like this idea of thinking about that latter, this, the second part of our life and how we want that to look, because it may not look the way we've spent the first half of our life. I mean, there are certainly experiences that I had in my 20s and my 30s that probably won't bear repeating. And similar to yourself, I'm glad I had them, but I'm at a, a different phase of life now. Um, it sounds like then for you, it was a timing matter to the extent that, you know, finding yourself with the right partner, um, being in that right phase of life as far as having had some of those various career experiences, which I mean, certainly you're, you're still very invested in career and and it sounds like you've got a really rich full life outside of being a mom as, as well as, of course, that being a very big fulfilling part. Um, so once you made the decision and, and can I ask, so how old were you when you were like, right, let's do this? And then was it smooth sailing from there or what happened next? <laughs> Well, if anyone's picked up bumping, they know that, no, it was not smooth sailing. And <laughs> frankly, that is, it was bumpy. Yes, it was absolutely bumpy. So I, you know, I think when I met my husband and we had, you know, we had an interesting relationship too. Like we broke up a couple times and then we found our way back to each other. But I think the thing that brought us together and keeps us together is we really do have this shared set of values, um, both as people and then as a family. And when I met him, I knew like, okay, this is, you know, he makes me laugh. We have this like wonderful partnership. You know, I obviously love him very much, but I also respect him. And we have a shared vision for kind of how we want to live, what we want life to be, and how we want to raise our kids. And that's not to say we agree on everything, because we don't, but we agree on the most important things and we're able to communicate it. But I think for me, you know, meeting him and talking about it, I was like, okay, I can see it. And then, you know, one of the things that I hear a lot in my work, because obviously I talk to, you know, people who are thinking about it, people who are in it, people who are postpartum, is just, well, how do you know when you're ready? And I think that that is one, and I would love to hear how you answer this question, but I, you know, even when I was pregnant with my second kid, there were days when I wasn't ready. I was like, wait a minute, I already have one of these and now I'm having another one. This is crazy. Like this seems so wild. And then of course, you know, he shows up and it's, you know, the change from one to two is a lot, but I'm not sure that there's ever a moment when you're a hundred percent ready because you don't know what you're getting ready for you don't know what's coming. You don't know what that kid is going to be like. You don't know what that baby is going to be like. You know, it's one thing to have a baby. It's another to have a child and start to make decisions for that child. So I think that I just, uh, as so many people do, kind of just held my breath and jumped. And fortunately, I really love my kids. So it worked out for, it worked Thank out for goodness. me. <laughs> yeah. I think my kids are the best. I really like as humans, I love them and I think they're fascinating and fun and we have dance parties in the kitchen and all of the things, but, um, you know, not everybody feels that way about their kids. Yeah. And that's something we don't talk about enough either. I totally agree. And it's funny because I often have people say, and not necessarily to me, but I see it a lot in, let's say, sort of child reforms or communities, parents coming in and saying, nobody regrets having kids. You know, everybody loves it. And it's like, well, it's something we don't talk about, but it does exist. It's not entirely commonplace. But, um, you know, I do think it's it's certainly a question that we need to evaluate. And I have a, a male friend and I thought, you know, only a man could... <laughs> approach things this way, but he was hundred percent not wanting to have his child. I don't know what the exact, you know, how that went down, but him and his partner ended up, she got pregnant and he loves being a dad. It is the best thing ever. It's incredible. But I thought, wow, you know, what a gamble or a risk because to be a mom going into it, thinking with every inch of my being, I do not want this and I'm doing it anyways. Um, that kind of like gives me all the creepy, weird feelings. <laughs> I think, I think there's enough risk that there's going to be challenges, which I know we'll talk about today. And I, I love, you know, I've heard you spoke, speak about this before that it is challenging. You may not like every part of it. And I, I think we need, I think we need to hear that more because I think part of what makes this a decision hard for people is they expect that the right decision for them will feel good all the time. And it just won't no matter what you choose. No, <laughs> no. I mean, oh my gosh, this morning, you know, one of the reasons yeah. I look like this this morning is because <laughs> my four-year-old just decided he didn't want to put on his shoes and go to school. And it was, you know, I remained calm, but 
it was a real freaking struggle this morning to get out the door. And, you know, it's, it is like, it's a series of challenges to manage kids, to parent, to stay calm. Um, you know, it is full of so much joy, but sometimes it's really hard. And I, one of, you know, I love that you're bringing this up because I think this is one of the fallacies with new parents, new first time Mm. parents, when that baby's born, that you're going to just instantly, instantly feel connected. And that is so not the case for so many people. Fathers, mothers, it does not matter. Some parents love the newborn phase. Guess what? Not a fan. First six months, you can have it. They smell good. It's, I'll it's, take it. It's I cool. always wanted a baby. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you have more? <laughs> no, I, 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 I can't physically have any more. So I'm yeah. all done. But man, if I did, I'd, you can come move in. But, I right. mean, obviously, I loved my kids. I loved them as babies. And yeah. also, every month that goes by, I like my kids a little bit more. Like my four-year-old's like the most fascinating, funny, amazing little human. My two-year-old is now like talking up a storm and and doing all of these things. And you, I can see who he's becoming. So yeah. for me, the baby phase was not was not my time. But I feel so much more settled as a parent and, um, you know, confident as a parent. I think that that is such a challenge for, you know, especially first-time parents. But even those of us who have been doing this for a while. I mean, I've been a parent for four and a half years now. And I think only now do I feel like I have a real perspective and point of view and confidence, uh, the kind of confidence that I really wanted. And like, look who you're talking to right now. I mean, I write about all of this. I research it. I do all of it. But I'm really putting a lot of those things aside to just start to trust myself uh, more. Mm. So little, little vignette from daily life, yeah. but you know, no, but <laughs> it, it's so good. And th- there's so many, oh gosh, there's so many things you've said that I want to just sort of highlight. Um, oh, I, I don't even know where to start. I mean, first of <laughs> all, when you talk about, when you talk about you and, and your partner, like really having that shared vision for life, t- thinking about and talking about, you know, how do we want to parent? How do we want our lives to look knowing that you're not necessarily going to be on the same page, but that is such a huge piece of this because it's important we do that for ourselves. And this is the work that I encourage people to do, but we also need to be having those conversations and having that shared vision with our partner because like, hello, there's going to be wake up calls anyways. But if you haven't talked about these, these various issues and areas of what it means to have and raise a child, um, you're you're certainly going to be in for a big surprise. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and money, money is such an important part of that conversation, money and childcare. So I'm revisiting bumping right now. It's coming out in its second edition in January, 2025, which yes, seems like a long time away, but it actually will come quickly. The number one thing people have asked me for is a baby budget, how to create Mm. a baby budget. That was the number one resource that people have asked for over the last, you know, four and a half, five years. And so I put that in the book, but I think this is a thing. It's like the least sexy part of this process in some ways, because who likes to talk about money? It's not fun. It's not it's not easy, especially if, you know, you and your partner have different perspectives, but Mm -hmm. it is actually, when you look at the data on what makes people happy or not happy that they had children, what gives people a sense of regret, largely it's tied to financial realities, whether or not you can afford it. Um, So, so if you are thinking about this decision, I think that's one of the first things that you should think about is what do I want my life with children to be? What am I willing to give up? And then what can I financially afford? Do I need to move somewhere else near family? You know, familiarize yourself with how much childcare costs because, like, in those first years, it's really expensive. Babies are expensive too, but I think we have, we live in a culture right now where I think there's just this emphasis on more, more, more. And the truth is, Mm -hmm. babies just don't need that much. You don't need to go out and spend $10,000 outfitting a nursery, even though so many people do. Uh, I have a real, you know, I'm a huge fan of consignment and buying secondhand and borrowing and trading and, you know, living kind of the village lifestyle that we were always supposed to, to live in this, in this world versus spending a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I certainly see that with parents that I know. And I would say most of the people I know who are parents, they're fairly well resourced financially, as well as having that community support. Um, I would, you know, from outside eyes would regard most of my friends and their partnerships as being very strong, communicative, 
um, relatively egalitarian. And so, you know, even with all of those things, it can be, of course, very challenging. But I, I've heard the same thing as what you mentioned, that, you know, the less we have of all those different support systems, the more challenging it can become. And that's really where parents start feeling like, oh, gosh, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Maybe that wasn't that right, that right move or like, you know, and, and that's not to say they don't love their kids or they don't wish they had their children, but should they or could they have cho chosen differently knowing what they know now, they perhaps would have. One thing I wanted to say, you mentioned to me, you sort of said, like, I'm curious what your take is as far as this sort of uncertainty piece, the fact that we're never going to like 100% know. And and I I agree with that. You know, I, I sort of, and you said something about like, I think you used the expression or a metaphor of like falling or sort of like taking the plunge or something like that. And I think about it a little bit that way. It's almost like jumping out of a plane, right? And I, I know for me personally, like there is nothing about jumping out of a plane that holds any sort of appeal, appeal. And people say to me like, oh, come on, if you did it, you'd love it. No, I think I would have a stroke and actually like it would be probably misery, misery. Um, if you have that, like, I think we can, we can want to have kids and also not feel ready. And I think there's like, there's a place there where we do it anyways. But if the wanting's not there, it's going to be hard for us to take the plunge. It's like, you're not going to get me up in the plane. Cause like no part of me is interested in that. Whereas I think about in my business, how many things, you know, reaching out to Leslie Schrock today. Okay. Like, am I ready to interview Leslie for this podcast? I mean, I don't know, but I'm like, hey, let's reach out. Let's see if she wants to come have a conversation. Like, because I wanted to, because I had that vision for myself to have this conversation, to create this podcast. And so, um, you know, while business is maybe not the same as having a child, I think we can look at some parallels in other areas of our life, thinking about those things that we're like excited about doing, even though we don't feel ready, but we just start. Like, we say we have enough of the pieces in place and it's a leap of faith, but it's one that I think can be very well rewarded. So. I don't yeah. know what you think of that as a parent. <laughs> I well, no, I mean I think I think that that is, you know, I think if I had to define my life and career by a sort of theme, it's that yeah. when I look around and see something that needs to be done and no one else is doing it or I feel a little skittish about it but I feel conviction that mm -hmm. I just need to figure it out, that is I think how I've approached parenting as well. You know, and there are yeah. lots of times when I don't have anything figured out. I'm like, I don't know why you're freaking out about this pair of shoes versus this pair. Don't know why you're so obsessed with these pants, but bro, they're dirty. Like put them in the hand, put them back. <laughs> like put them back. You're not wearing dirty pants to school. Oh. You know, but I I think it's it, we're so disconnected from our bodies and minds these days. Yeah. And it's, it's so difficult. You know, I'm very private on social media. I don't post photos of my kids for lots of reasons. I'm actually yeah. getting into that and bumping, but identity theft is one of them. But also I just don't want them to be on display all the time so that when they're in their twenties, there are pictures of them like hatching from eggs and dressed as cabbages as, yeah. you know, like babies, you know, that I don't feel that's my decision to make for them. They're really cute and they're funny and I think they're awesome. But um, I, I think we're so, we have all of these examples of what life is going to be like because we look at Instagram and TikTok and we look at celebrity culture and we think, well, this is what it's going to be. And then we also have, you know, our parent friends who sometimes scare the SHIT out of us with mm -hmm. the stories and with the things. But, you know, something I come back to a lot is we were never really meant to raise families this way. The way that we're raising families today, uh, which is so disconnected from our extended families outside of kind of a village. And I'm not saying we should all live in communes, although maybe we should. Uh, it's, I think it's certainly kind of appealing yeah. if you have small kids. <laughs> but totally. I, I think that, you know, we're relying on all of these external forces and inputs uh, and, and examples of things that lack context. You know, I, this is a huge problem in the postpartum period where you look at some celebrity who had a baby two weeks ago, four weeks ago, whatever, and you see them and you think, well, why doesn't my body look like that? And yeah. there's probably a lot of Photoshop and filtering and whatever that's happened there. But we just don't have context. We don't have what's happening behind the scenes. How many nannies do they have? How many people yeah. do they have behind the scenes? How many private chefs do they have and personal, you know, private, uh, you know, activity coaches and everything else? It's mm -hmm. unbelievable. But I, I think that, you know, Ultimately, it really does come down to, um, for, for me anyway, 
I think you've got to have the confidence that you're going to figure it out one way or the other because parenting is full of unexpected moments. Pregnancy is too. Fertility is too. I had in the end three miscarriages. I had two before the birth of my first son. The second we actually had to, I had to have an abortion. It was Mm -hmm. the worst experience of my entire life. It's what led me to be a writer because I started researching and looking into, you know, what had happened. We had a chromosomally abnormal pregnancy that was on its way to ending anyway. But it hadn't actually ended yet. It was done, but it was, um, you know, the, the, the fetus wasn't growing. Mm. But it was technically an abortion. And I thought, wow, no one's talking about this part. No one talks about the pain, you know, and the anguish of, of infertility. And then on the other hand, pregnancy can be kind of a, you know, a mind uh, game with you every day. And then the yeah. postpartum period, and that's just getting started. It is just this huge metamorphosis that you go through as a person. I'm certainly yeah. not the same person that I was before I had kids. My friendships yeah. are different. My relationships are different. My worldview is different. So, yeah. Well, and it's something you've you've mentioned a couple of times now, like talking about sort of these changes that have happened and how you've, you know, what you've learned, how you've grown through parenthood. And I think that's something important for people listening to keep in mind is we see ourselves making this decision. Yes. Okay. Based on who we are today, but we have to remember that the person who's going to be in that situation, dealing with the challenges and the question marks and the, I don't know. And of course the beautiful fulfilling parts as well, that, that is, that is not going to be the same person that you are today. You will change and evolve through that. Okay, Leslie, I, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, I want to, I want to talk about this book because I think everything you've just talked about here, and thank you for also sharing, um, you know, some of your personal journey and the losses that were accompanying, um, your, your pregnancies. And this is something that I don't think we think about that much when we're on the fence. Sure. We know, okay. Our fertility is probably not improving as we age. Uh, yes, I think, uh, fortunately, you know, I know at least in my circle, there's a lot more openness around pregnancy loss, miscarriage. Um, I, I know a couple of people who have had late stage pregnancy, stillbirth, obviously very heartbreaking and, and difficult. It is something that it's, I still don't think it's getting as much. Um, it's not as much part of conversation as it could be, but it's nice to see there's more awareness. However, when we're so mired in our own indecision, I don't know what I want. What's next? Okay. All we want is to make a decision. And we forget that just because we, let's say, decide, yes, I want to have kids. There's no guarantee that that's going to happen. There's no guarantee that it's going to be easy. And I'm not saying it's a question for people to assess right now, but at a point we do need to think, okay, if I want this, like, I don't want to say how much do we want it, but like, to what ends are we willing to go? And so I want to just move over a little bit to your book, Fertility Rules, which again, this is a fantastic book. If you're thinking about having a child, get this book. If you're not thinking about it and you're interested in your body and your health, get this book because it's just really interesting. I said to Chris, I was like telling him all these things I'm reading about his sperm. I was like, you've got to read this book. This is fantastic. So I think this, this, first of all, let's just talk about how this question pertains to women because we seem to, women on the fence are like, I have to decide. I'm getting older. My fertility is waning. Um, This is on me. My husband can become a father almost indefinitely. And we see this reinforced by, you know, narratives in the media. Like I think Al Pacino recently became a father at age 83. Like, gross. I'm sorry. (laughs) I just need to, (laughs) I just need to say that. Um, Why do you, first of all, is is it wrong that we're putting this, all this pressure solely on women? Is this a women's problem, the fertility equation when it comes to having kids? This is a very complicated question and it actually has two components, neither of which are, uh, things that a lot of people are going to want to hear. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to put, I'm going to put that warning out there, but it is the truth. Um, so there are two different issues. One is as you age, your egg quality goes down. And what does that mean? It's not about the number of eggs in your ovaries, although low, you know, diminished ovarian reserve is an, is an issue too. It's about the quality, meaning Mm. that your body's ability to perform cell division and prepare and mature an egg for ovulation just gets worse as you get older. And there is nothing you can do about it. There is no pill that you can take. There's no way to reverse engineer an egg that is chromosomally abnormal. Once it's done, it's done. And this starts getting worse for women in their 30s. This is the primary driver. Abnormal chromosomal abnormalities are the primary cause of miscarriage. Mm -hmm. It's not falling. It's not all these other things that we think are our fault. 
Um, it just is a function of age and your body being worse at cell division. So, and I wish I could like put this on a billboard on in Times Square so that everyone yeah. would read it because it's just a biological reality. No pills. The other thing that's difficult to talk about is that there's the getting pregnant part and the staying pregnant, meaning not miscarrying. But then there is also what happens during a pregnancy and during birth when you are older. And the truth of the matter is that as your body ages, pregnancy is harder. Childbirth is harder. Our bodies are kind of biologically wired to give birth earlier in life. Um, and you talk to some OBs and you ask them, you know, what is it like delivering a 20-year-old versus a 40-year-old? And they'll say things like, oh, God, this 20-year-old, it was just like poetry. Everything worked. You know, the rate of complications, the rate of placental issues, um, you know, just goes up as you age. So childbirth is just also less safe as you are older. Those two things, it's egg quality and it's okay. what happens to your body. It's all just biology. Our bodies were meant to kind of do this at a younger age. And it's so hard to talk about. It is so yeah. unfair that this is true, but it is true. And men, mm -hmm. by the way, are not immune from this either. The number of okay. mutations in sperm goes up when men hit 40. So, you know, the rates of schizophrenia, autism, all of these, you know, neurological issues. I think that's one of the things that's been studied the most, even though we know very little about sperm, sadly. It's a pretty ridiculous oversight, in my opinion, and something I'd really like to see change. Okay, if you have been spending the last several months or maybe years making pros and cons lists, trying to figure out whether you wanna have kids or stay child-free, I'm gonna encourage you to stop right there and to do something different instead. And that is to check out one of our upcoming kids or child free online workshops. These are two hour online workshops hosted in the company of like-minded women, where I'm going to give you some of the actual tools and resources that I personally use to help make my kids or child free decision. You're going to walk away from this workshop with a workbook that you can go through on your own time. And I can tell you that these two hours together are going to give you so much more clarity and direction in terms of the right choice for you. Find all the details on an upcoming Kids or Child Free workshop over at kidsorchildfree.com or in the show notes of this episode. So you, you just said a few things there that I want to touch on. Now, one thing, just, just to kind of work backwards here, you're talking about things like um, schizophrenia, autism, I think was what you mentioned. Uh, this was something I was surprised to read about in the book because I thought, okay, we know about, for example, in a in potential inability or difficulty conceiving. We know about perhaps more propensity towards having miscarriages. Maybe we also know it's going to be more difficult in our bodies or perhaps more dangerous to give birth. But when I thought about perhaps chromosomal issues with later in life pregnancy, I'm thinking about the things we talk about like Down syndrome or, you know, other like maybe more visible disabilities that we may see in a child. I would not have thought that something like a mental health condition like schizophrenia is going to be, there's more likelihood and also looking at if it's the father's older. So, I mean, first of all, I, I didn't know this and I'm thinking, I don't know how many people know this, but that your partner, as they age, the quality of their sperm also decreases. I'm curious to know, and I know you shared in the book, but I'd love to hear it from you here. When a couple is having trouble conceiving, and I, I've had a number of friends where this has been the case, and of course, the woman, after a certain period of time, they're sort of allowed to get checked out. Okay, it's been X number of months based on their age. Now they can go to see their, their OBGYN, their specialist. And we go through all these tests. Sometimes they get, you know, end up getting IVF or what have you. I don't hear that much about men getting checked for these things. So are men also... <laughs> Right. So are men responsible? And if so, how often if a couple is unable to get or stay pregnant? Every single trip, first appointment to a fertility clinic should involve both. Okay. If you are at a clinic and they are not testing both of you at the onset of treatment, even if you know you have PCOS or endometriosis or some other mm -hmm. issue, it doesn't mean there's not something also going on with your partner. And the American College of Gynecology agrees. All of these medical organizations say that the guidelines should be both people are examined at the 
at the very beginning of a fertility journey. This is still not done, and it's not done for some pretty perverse reasons, mostly to do with money. It is much more financially uh, mm. advantageous for clinics to treat women. And it's much more financially advantageous for them to just say, well, even if the issue is a man, like we just, we'll move on to IVF and then you'll just be good. We'll do ICSI. It's a procedure where you only need one viable sperm that looks good under a microscope. We'll just shoot that guy up in the egg and we'll be done. So I, I think it's something that, you know, to those of you who are struggling with either unexplained infertility or just aren't getting pregnant or staying pregnant, if you go to a clinic and they're not offering to treat your partner at the same time they're treating you, you need mm. to go to a different clinic or you demand it. Uh, it's not ethical to, to do that because I think there's, you know, there's, there are actually three categories to the people I think that are probably listening in to this, this podcast, which yeah. is child free by choice, parent by choice, and then child free, not by choice. I mm -hmm. think that's a category of people that often gets really neglected because yeah. you just don't think about it. But sometimes people, you know, spend years and years and years. I was actually very happy that Jennifer Aniston spoke out about this recently mm -hmm. and said, yeah, I took the teas, I did the things and it just didn't work for me. And we don't know why. We don't know, you know, what exactly she did. But that is another category of people. And, you know, who knows if she had Brad Pitt tested? I don't know. But yeah. it's, yeah. you know, like who knows what was going on there and it's nobody's business what went on there. But, um, you know, this is another reason that getting your partner tested is so important because sometimes it has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on in a woman's body. Okay. And I think in the book you said like it, it could be as many as like half the cases where there's there's issues that it could be the, the male that I don't want to say is at fault. Fault's not really the right word to use here, but that would be like responsible is not the right that, word. We so can just say fault. Everyone the, understands what what's the right way of putting this. <laughs> the, I, I would say the cause because the I cause. It, it, people Thank say you. all the time whose fault is it? And it's like, yeah, does it? It's, that's not really the question we should be asking. No. The, the cause of around half of infertility is in men's bodies. So it's about a third exclusively women, a third exclusively men, and a third is either a combination of both or it's unexplained. Okay. Now, something else you said, I mean, you're talking about like, this is just a function of aging that the quality of our eggs are going to decrease. The quality of sperm is going to decrease. And um, I'm going to be cheeky here and say, okay, but here's me. I'm super healthy. I eat a plant-based diet. I'm really active. I'm. People say I look so much younger than my age. So it shouldn't be a problem for me. True or false? Well, you can look at me. You want some end of one data here. Yeah. You yeah. look at me. I have been active my whole life. I eat well. I'm moderate in most things. I, I on paper, am, there's no reason in the world that I should have had three miscarriages. And yet... Yeah. Here I am. I think that that is one of the real fallacies of, you know, that I really was trying to debunk in fertility rules is that just because on paper it looks like everything should be fine and you present in a certain way, there's no possible way of knowing exactly what's going on in your body unless you're doing testing. And even then, sometimes you just won't know, but there's no test you can take really to say, well, you know, your body's still performing meiosis pretty well. So you'll probably ovulate chromosomally normal eggs. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> Someday. I remember when I was on the fence about whether or not to have kids, I remember I was approaching 30 and I, I really could not decide. I couldn't seem to figure this out. It was causing me so much angst and stress. And I, I'd been with my partner already for a few years. And so I thought, okay, I'm just going to put this off until I'm 35. And you probably know why, because 35 is like that number that I've been told where my fertility is going to drop off like, you know, on a cliff, which I guess maybe 34 would have been the better number to aim for based on my <laughs> making sense of this. Is 35, you mentioned like through the 30s, I think, but is 35, like, is there a fertility drop off or is that, is that not correct? Well, okay. So there's this famous diagram that shows the age of 35 being just like exactly what you described, this giant cliff mm. that was based on data from a very homogenous population and it was done during the French Revolution. So it doesn't really reflect what's going ago? on today. <laughs> yeah, just a few years ago. Um, listen, the 35 number is when I wish people would freeze eggs based on the data that we have. So if you're okay. thinking about fertility preservation, 
the time to do it ideally is before 35 because you're going to be able to build the biggest egg bank. That does not mean you cannot still get pregnant naturally. Plenty of people still get pregnant naturally into their 40s. Now, the number, the percentage of people who do it successfully each month drops more and more each year that passes after 35. And 39 is really the big dip. That is when it becomes much because your body's ability to uh, perform meiosis and do cell division accurately just goes down a lot more at that age. And again, there's no pill you can take, no amount of CoQ10 that is going to restore that ability. We can't Benjamin button our ovaries or any, you know, our mitochondria, anything else. It's just a biological reality. Okay. Too bad. So sad. Hey, <laughs> I know. I, I'm so glad you're sharing all this with us because I mean, we, as much as we want to friends, we can't fight reality and we need, it's better to be aware because what I would hate for someone to do is to make the assumption that like, yeah, sure. I can get pregnant as long as I decide by X age, or I can just, you know, should, should, should all work out for me when, when, and if I decide. And so I think we need to, we need to be aware of this, but not just be aware where it's like this kind of ephemeral sort of cloud over our heads. Like I, I, this is why I really suggest that you check out Leslie's book so that you can actually arm yourself with some facts. Now I've heard people saying like, well, if you're not sure, and you're thinking about getting pregnant, like you can go or you should go get your fertility tested. Is that something that people can do? And if so, what should they be asking their doctors for? So if you're thinking about getting pregnant, you should go in for a preconception checkup and exactly what your doctor will, you know, tell you to test kind of depends what's going on with your health overall. So if, for example, you have hypertension or type 2 diabetes or another comorbidity, um, or if you're out of the band of normal BMI, which is unfortunately how they still assess uh, all mm -hmm. of this, it's still the benchmark, even though it's a really stupid measure of overall health. Um, they may have different guidance based on that. Now, if you go in and you say, I really want to do a hormone test to test my fertility, mm -hmm. the problem you're going to run into, at least in the United States, is it has to be for diagnostic purposes. They're not going to just give you this big blood workup because you're fertility curious. If you want to okay. do that, you can go online and there are fertility tests that you can order, take from home. It's usually a dried blood spot, meaning you prick your finger with a lancet, you put a couple drops of blood in circles, and then you mail it back. The limit to these tests is that they test markers. They test AMH, they test FSH and other things. And a lot of people assume that AMH is a really good indicator of your fertility and your ability to naturally conceive. And the truth is it is not. It tells you about your ovarian reserve. It tells you, you know, kind of how many eggs you have left. It doesn't tell you anything about the quality of those eggs. And as we all know, it just takes one. So, you know, if you do have low AMH, it means that now is the time to start. That's that's a good way to think about it. But it does not mean you're only, you're going to have to go get IVF. Uh, and I think that's one of the the really big myths that um, I still see online is you know oh I have low AMH I'm never going to get pregnant. It's like well there are other markers that matter too, and there's yeah. a lot more that goes into it than just AMH. Yeah. Yeah. And it's definitely something I hear like people talk about like, oh, I don't have any eggs left or I, I don't really hear people talking or thinking about the quality of their eggs, which I think is a really important part or piece of this conversation. And it sounds like, you know, unfortunately there, although I guess medicine is improving, there's so many different factors and variables that come into this process of, of getting and staying pregnant that it's hard to be definitively sure unless you go try. <laughs> yeah. Well, and egg, and I want to be clear about something else. It, yeah. Much to uh, the chagrin of the fertility industry, the marketing claims that they put out about egg freezing are simply not true. It is not a guarantee. Just because you have yeah. an egg bank doesn't mean any of them are going to be chromosomally normal. It doesn't mean you're going to end up with a live birth. In fact, I think the number is 39%, 37% of mm. people who go back to use their frozen eggs later have a live birth. So it is not a guarantee. We need more data on that. That was a single study, a single um, center study. But I think it presents a pretty interesting picture um, that, you know, it's putting them on ice doesn't necessarily mean 
that you're going to, you know, have the outcome that you want. Freezing embryos is something that, you know, some people choose to do. There are issues with that too, though. You know, you have more information, you know, you know, you have a score, you have a grade for those embryos, you can test to see if they're chromosomally normal, but you won't know for sure. And also there are some weird things, you know, in the world we live in today, at least in the U.S., uh, with reproductive rights and personhood laws. Uh, mm -hmm. And also embryos are considered assets in a marriage. So it's very important if you are thinking about that to paper that at the very beginning of the process because if you and your partner split up, so too will your embryos. I read a book about that once. I don't know how to say her last name. Jody Picoul, I think. Or Picoul, oh, yeah. However you say <laughs> she wrote a book about this happening, and that's exactly what happened in the book. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're talking a little bit more about egg freezing because I think that a lot of people think about that as like a good alternative. If you're not sure, well, just freeze your eggs and then you can decide later. Um, which, you know, I can appreciate there may be some scenarios in which egg freezing is a good or better idea than not? Like, I, maybe I can ask you, what do you think a, a good reason for a woman to say, I want to freeze my eggs is? If in you your have, opinion, understanding this is subjective, but. Well, I mean, the number one reason women do it is because they haven't found their partner. So yeah. I think that if you can pay for it and you understand that it is an invasive procedure, you understand that, you know, it is a commitment. It's a mm -hmm. financial commitment, time commitment, body commitment, emotional commitment, and mm -hmm. there is no guarantee at the end of it. Um, and if you're, you know, if you fit the profile, meaning that you are on the, like if, if you're 42 and you go to a clinic and someone's trying to freeze your eggs, uh, run. No. Yeah. Run. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, are you the health profile? Can you afford to do it? Um, mm -hmm. And then also, you know, are you okay if you do this, that it's a hedge, it's not an insurance policy? Yeah. Okay. And so let's just say I freeze my eggs and then I meet this great partner and all of a sudden I'm like 40 or 41. Like, I, I, I know you mentioned that um, having the eggs, of course, doesn't necessarily necessitate a live birth, but like, what other factors are going into it? Like you talk about, for example, the age of the mother giving birth. Like I'm guessing all those things are still going to pertain if you're older. There's still age-related factors that are going to go into all this aside from just how young your eggs are. Is that right? Well, so I, you know, actually gestating a human comes with mm -hmm. its own, you know, increased risks as the age mm -hmm. of the mother increases. But, you know, if you go into a pregnancy with younger eggs, the risk of miscarriage is just going to be younger, assuming they're chromosomally normal. So going into an IVF, uh, you know, procedure, which by the way, some people at 40 or 41 don't need. Some people do conceive naturally at that age. Yeah. It is not unheard of and it is not uncommon. It just takes often more time and maybe some Clomid or maybe something else, you know, you just yeah. don't know, but it's not impossible to conceive naturally. And I would say yeah. that if you meet an awesome person, it would be worth trying to do it on your own for a little bit um, as you consider what to do about, you know, IVF or you prepare for IVF, um, you know, go yeah. in for a consult with, with someone, talk to your doctor and then, you know, you can roll the dice, but you shouldn't wait too long. You know, if it's six months, the timeline to seek help, if you're not getting pregnant, when you're over 35 is six months. Yeah. If you're under 35, it is 12 months. And the reason is that a very large percentage, almost 90% of people will conceive naturally on that timeline, um, assuming there's not you know, it, another issue. So most people okay. do make it work. And that is why that timeline exists. But this is also another reason, you know, ultimately people ask me why I wrote fertility rules. And I say, well, you know, I wanted, I don't believe that we are going to solve the problems in maternal health without educating people about their bodies before. I also think it's absolutely embarrassing the way that we teach reproductive health in this country. Um, yeah. We don't teach people basics of, you know, f fertile windows or any of these other things that they really need to know. But the other joke that I make is that my, you know, the thing that I end up workshopping with friends and random strangers is explaining ovulation. People don't even understand how ovulation works. Yeah. When do you actually have sex to have a baby? You don't wait until the minute you ovulate. If you do that, you're going to miss the egg. So um, I think there's just a lot that we do not teach people. And, you know, that is such a driving mission of mine at this point with, with my work. You know, I get to kind of act as a journalist and an educator now but everyone should understand 
how ovulation works because otherwise you're never going to get pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Kind of important. Um, I'm curious to know a couple questions. So what advice would you give to someone who let's say is like, let's call it their late thirties. I talked to a lot of women, they're in their late thirties, they're on the fence, they're in a relationship in many cases, and they just can't seem to come to a decision. Now, I'm reluctant to say, just go ahead, do it anyways. Um, however, I, I, and I guess maybe I'm more looking for your reassurance with this. Like a lot of people say, you're just going to know. And my thinking is if you've been on the fence, if you're indecisive for a period of time, I think it's probably pretty slim likelihood. You're going to wake up one day and say, now I know there is going to be that leap of faith. So what would you say to someone who's in that relationship? They're on the fence they're in their late thirties, you know, times a ticking, what advice would you give them to help them get some more clarity or like to help move them along one direction or the other? I would say if you haven't had a very direct conversation with your partner about Mm -hmm. your goals and what you want and their goals and what they want, that would be the number one thing. And it's, I mean, I'm sure you run into this in your work. It is shocking how few people do that because they're scared Mm -hmm. of what their partner's going to say. But People get married not knowing whether or not their partner wants yeah. kids. It is a conversation every single person should have before they ever get married because it is the single biggest decision you make other than who yeah. you marry. So I think the number one thing is getting some clarity on it yourself and then creating an environment in your relationship that feels safe and it feels good where you feel confident to say to your partner, hey, I need to talk to you about whether or not you would like to have children, and if you do, how you see that playing out. And you can, you know, there are actually like, there's a whole list of questions in uh, Fertility Rules to talk about with your partner. I think it's really important that you talk through really kind of nuanced things about finances, about childcare, about how you see work playing out, family support, all of these things. But if you don't talk about it, you'll never know. So that's where I tell people to start. It's like, it's not a decision I can make for anyone, nor would I ever want to. But I no. think until, if you can't talk- <laughs> Me neither. And, and, I don't make it for them either. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and here's the other, here's the other truth that's really difficult to, to, for people to digest, which is that if you can't talk to your partner about this, you're probably not in the right relationship. Uh, and because there are so many things to talk about later in life, you know, you're, even if you don't have children, health decisions, you know, who does what, if someone, you know, ends up having a heart attack, like there are so many decisions that rely on open communication that I think, you know, use this opportunity to figure it out. And it is so tempting. Sometimes we all kind of, you know, are with people sometimes that we kind of know in the back of our heads aren't right. But oftentimes this is the this is the decision that clarifies that. Totally. Well, and I think actually having this conversation can also help clarify your own feelings. Like you're having this conversation, you feel like you're putting yourself through the motions and you're like, I don't know, this doesn't feel like something I really actually want to do. I think we should and to go back to something you said earlier in our conversation, we need to listen to our bodies, which is something we're not super attuned to doing. And so would you say there is like wisdom in our bodies that we can tap into where it concerns this decision? And if so, what might that look like? I mean, I think it's what it feels like. Think about how yeah. your body feels when you're having yes. these conversations. Are you like this? Are you like, I can't imagine having kids? Or are you like, yeah, actually, you know, I'm a little more open. Like, I think paying attention to your posture, paying attention to how you carry yourself, paying attention to your voice, how your brain feels. You know, do you need, like, some people need a glass of wine or something to have this conversation. Other people absolutely don't. Yeah. Um, so I think that you you have to tap into how you feel in a very authentic and real and truthful way, which is very hard. It is very yeah. hard. But you, you need to find the space, the physical space and the mental space that give you the confidence to, to talk uh, and be honest with yourself. And I think that that's the thing. Therapy can be very, very helpful in this, uh, in mm-hmm. this way. You know, I did grief counseling when I had my miscarriages and yeah. had my husband and I not had so many conversations before we got married about all of these things. I would have done couples counseling with him before we started a family for sure. Because yeah. it's it, it, there are little things along the way that just, even if you are on the same page, it's still really hard. Yeah. Such, such good advice there. I mean, I think 
we can't emphasize enough the importance of having these conversations with your partner, looking at how they respond, looking at like, do you have the same short shared vision of what's going to happen? Or maybe, maybe the same uncertainty or ambivalence, but like, do, is there like a cohesion there? And then I love the advice to not pay attention as I use the words, you know, how does that look? How does that feel? Um, and, and I would add to that, not necessarily having judgment about that. I know it's easy for us to, I shouldn't feel this way. I should be feeling this way. Like what's wrong with me. This isn't womanly. This is, this was a big narrative that I have, but having some self-compassion. Okay. I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable right now. Okay. This is, and that doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't have a child, but it's just observing what's coming up and, and paying attention to that. Okay. Leslie, I could talk to you for, ever. Um, we'll definitely have to have you back on perhaps closer to the launch of your next book to talk about what's in that book. I think it sounds like there's a lot of really great info coming. And um, certainly I want to encourage you all to check out both bump and infertility rules. Um, I, I'd love to just wrap this up. So I have a few sort of rapid fire questions. But before that, as a mother, going back to your personal experience, what do you love best about being a mom? Sing its praises for us, if you will. Oh, I mean, I, I'm going to just tell you the truth, which is it's the best thing I've ever done and it's the hardest thing I've ever done. It is so humbling uh, every single day because there are things that you just have to put aside and you have to strip your life down to what is most important. But I think that being a mother has given my life focus that I never would have had otherwise. Mm. And I've always been a pretty maniacally focused person, but I feel, I just look at the two of them and I feel such a sense of fulfillment's maybe not the right word, but I just feel the swell of love that is so unique and so different to anything else. And I love the way that I look at the world and feel the world and experience the world because I have to do it again. I'm like, wait a minute, what do you see over there? That's, oh, wait a second. Oh, this is how that feels to you? Oh, wait, you think that, fascinating, okay, you know? <laughs> and and it's yeah. just, but it is, it's humbling and it's so hard. I'm not a morning person. My four-year-old is a freaking morning person, like wakes me up every morning, drives me crazy. But I also am like, there are very few people I would actually be fine with waking me up. So, yeah. you know, I love it. It's hard. I don't love every minute of it. Sometimes I'm like, really, guys? Really, you're going to start? Okay, now you're tackling each other. Please don't. Okay, you just hit that. Great. Um, but it really, really takes you out of yourself and um, gives you a new lens on the world. Yeah. Well, it's a, a beautiful testament to motherhood. I think it's a, a real perspective. It's it's hard, it's fulfilling, it's beautiful, it's new, it's, it offers focus. And I think good things are hard often. And I think if, if you want that challenge, um, yeah, an invitation to consider that. Okay, before we wrap things up, I have some sort of rapid fire questions that I like to ask all my guests. Um, the first couple are finish this sentence. Being a mom is? Joy. Being a mom is not? Easy. I'm curious, what do you think one thing might be, and this could be like societally speaking, or this could be situational, but one thing that might make this decision a little bit easier for women who are on the fence? Radical honesty. Mm, I love that. All right. What is one thing that you would love for women who are child free to know? We parents love you too. It shouldn't be an adversarial, as it sometimes is. It's really, yeah. really, uh, I have lots of child-free friends, and we've talked about it a lot. I totally respect their decisions. I love them for their decisions, and I don't judge them at all. I think it's people have to make the right decisions for them. But, um, you know, just talking and being honest, and I don't know. I love my child-free friends, and I so respect it. Yeah. If you could give one piece of advice to someone who's currently on the fence about whether or not to have kids, what would that be? Having young kids is really hard. It is a lot of work. It is often thankless work. You have to put yourself aside an awful lot, but really it is a short period of time. And I think we get very focused on the kind of zero to seven age, which is adorable and cute and also like, like I said, kind of thankless and hard sometimes. 
But what we don't think about is what happens later in life. We don't think about, you know, what is this going to be like in 20 years or 30 years when this kid is an adult and we get to hang out and, you know, go do things in life together. And I get to watch them grow and I get to watch them experience the world as adults and be more of a friend as I think, you know, all parents kind of eventually want to see their kids as adults. So, you know, I, I think it's be honest that, yeah, the first few years are, it's like, it's like, un, it's relentless. Parenting is relentless in the first years. There's always something, there's always something changing. And also think about what you want your life to be when you're in your fifties and your sixties and your seventies and your eighties, if you're a woman, cause we're living way longer these days and think about who you want to be surrounded by. And if you're willing to make the sacrifice um, you know, that's required because it is a sacrifice. Uh, and for some people it won't be worth it and it won't feel worth it. And I think that that's maybe my closing comment is that if you do decide this is not for me, there's nothing wrong with you. You can be part of your friends, kids' lives or siblings or whatever, but not everyone needs to or should have children. And I think it's just being honest with yourself about what you care about, what you're willing to give up, and what the experience is really going to be like. Because like I said, it's the best thing I've ever done. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Thank you so much, Leslie Schock, for coming on the, the podcast today. This is a really beautiful conversation. Um, I so value everything you've shared. I know our listeners will feel the same way when they hear this, this interview. And yeah, thank you for coming on. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay, now that we've wrapped up today's conversation, this is the part of the episode where I tell you that you need to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. And you really need to do that. And I'm going to tell you why. And that is because one of the big ways that people find and discover new podcasts like this one is through reviews. So if you yourself can go say what you loved about this podcast, why people who are on the fence should tune into the Kids Are Child Free podcast, that's going to help other people who are also wondering, should I have kids or stay child free to discover us? Thank you in advance for doing so. I will be featuring some of the reviews in upcoming episodes. So maybe I'll share yours. You never know. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you back here soon for our next episode.